Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Cyber Defense, the Effective Incident Response and Handling. So today's webinar will focus on the tools and knowledge you will need to protect yourself and your organization. Our presenter today is Jim Gabberty, and he is here with us on behalf of Pace University. He'll help you navigate through the introduction and the topics we will be handling today. <laughs> Professor Gabberty is an ICT practitioner with over 30 years of experience in academia and industry with extensive training from leading institutions. He has been featured in Business Week, The Economist, and Wired Magazine, as well as numerous other academic and professional journals. So before we get started, I just wanted to remind you of a few housekeeping rules. Please keep yourself on mute. This will help eliminate any background noise during the presentation. Second, we will be recording the presentation for future viewing, so if you would like to review this after the webinar is over, you can let us know and we can send you the link. Third, as the webinar is taking place, and you have questions, you can type them in a chat box to the right hand side of your screen towards the bottom. You can either send your question to the entire audience or directly to me at ACCA USA. These will be answered at the end of the presentation during our Q&A period. Uh, fourth, there will be three polling questions during the presentation. Please make sure to participate in these polling questions in order to receive credit for attending. And finally, the CPE certificates will be emailed within three business days of the conclusion of this training. So without further ado, I am going to unmute our presenter and change it over to Jim Gabberty. So just give us one second. Okay. Good? Yes. Okay, good to go. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello again to those of you that uh, tuned in last time. Uh, I mean, it's been a while since we've, uh, we've uh, had a discussion here, but I think there was a social uh, engineer we were speaking about last time. So today's uh, discussion will be on effective incident handling. And uh, what I intend to do today is to just generally give you some ideas and takeaways that, that will help you personally and will help the companies uh, that, that um, you work for. Um, and uh, let's see, I think we're good with the, I think the webcam is up. Give us one sec while we just take care of a technical difficulty. <laughs> Should be good. There he is. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dito. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, all right. Let's let's get started then. So, I, I don't think I'm going to take the whole hour. Uh, I, I will uh, throw in some uh, anecdotal information uh, throughout this uh, discussion because it tends to be a little bit of a dry discussion. But uh, nonetheless, let's get started. So, all companies undergo um, cybersecurity incidents. Uh, I'm a not only am I a, a, an instructor of uh, how to hack, I also help companies uh, blue team or you know, uh, set up their systems to defend against hackers. Um, I've been doing this for many, many years now, and I'm pretty, pretty uh, comfortable in the world of cybersecurity. And uh, it's incredibly uh, easy um, these days to get into compute the people's computers just by leaving USB thumb drives around and hoping that someone will pick them up and be crazy enough to stick it in their computer, etc. So uh, there are a lot of uh, attack vectors that companies. Uh, have to to uh, for, for the attackers uh, to attack. So again, the question is not when they're going to get hacked, but uh, how often they're going to get hacked. Uh, companies have a thank you. Companies have a um, companies have a, a, a security posture where uh, they know that. Uh, that they're in a, in a, in a defen almost defenseless position and it costs a lot of money for them to bring the risk down to zero. Uh, even if a, a company were to say we want absolute secrecy, uh, we, want, uh, we, we have a zero uh, tolerance level, uh, it's virtually impossible to do that uh, because even things like air gapping uh, doesn't work. Air, air gapping is when you take a computer 100% offline um, uh, but still, there are, as long as a human being is involved, there are ways to get into and out of that system and share the data. So most companies uh, do anticipate the loss of uh, 
the CIA tried, which is uh, losing some measure of confidentiality, integrity, or the availability of the systems that they uh, operate. And so the question is, you know, how, how do we deal with this eventuality that a company is currently under attack, or is under attack and doesn't know it, or uh, hasn't been attacked yet, but you know, will be attacked? So the whole notion then of preparation comes into uh, into focus. And um, incident handling is about the, the process of making yourself as you know, ready as you can be uh, to prepare for the eventuality of being attacked. Um, the, uh, the question I usually throw out to people when they say, you know, how much preparation should we have? I, I ask them a, a generic question and a question might be like, um, well, if today when you, you know, left the home and you came to work, uh, what if you had an unexpected fall or something happened to you today that caused you to go, say, to the emergency room and you had to spend an overnight, God forbid, for whatever reason? Um, you know, do you have plans uh, already made to bring the dog in, to feed the dog, uh, or to walk the dog, to take the mail in, to you know, lock your doors, to do certain things that you would normally do uh, when you're home? Uh, and if the answer is no, then you know, think of how uh, complicated it gets when uh, when the unforeseen uh, attack happens to a co corporation. Um, you know, if someone uh, is gets into Amazon.com, what do they do? They can't take the company down. Uh, there are measures that they have to put in place prior to that to, to, to anticipate uh, the, these incidents as they occur. So I guess the biggest question that um, companies have is, uh, and the biggest question I have for companies is, if you find somebody has infiltrated your system, or if you are the, the, the uh, victim of a cyber attack, will you generally pursue legal action? Um, and that's a that's a very tough question to ask somebody. Then they can't really say it depends uh, because the, the answer um, will kind of precludes what you do in in, in the preparation phase. So uh, if you say that you're absolutely going to pursue legal action for anybody who uh, launches an attack against the network or the computer or uh, the availability of the computer, what happens if you find out that the attacker is someone from inside your organization? Are you still going to prosecute? Uh, what happens if you find out they're from outside your organization or from a competitor, competitor, um, or just from some accidental action by somebody that you know happened to gain access uh, to your system? There was an event that happened to me about a year ago where I was uh, logging into um, an account that uh, my university gives out, and it's, it's typically given to many companies here in the New York area where uh, companies will give you pre-paid uh, transit uh, vouchers and parking vouchers. Uh, for tax purposes, and, and uh, every week or so I log in and, and, um, and check my balance. So one Friday afternoon I went home and I logged into the system, which uh, again was a, a, a publicly facing system that had uh, not only my uh, credentials, but the credentials of you know, the many thousands of customers they had. And I did something accidental, that accidental on my computer. I must have hit a couple of keys uh, when th that I shouldn't have hit. Um, and the next thing you know, I, I was in a, in, a, in a command shell on their system, and I saw the SQL commands uh, or the statements, the computer statements that were running to support the application. In other words, I accidentally broke the computer. So I took a screen. I mean, my heart started uh, pounding when this happened to me because I, I, I'm aware of what, what I had done. Uh, accidentally, I took a screenshot. I started writing out all, all information. I was calling the company, but the company was... Uh, closed because it was after five o'clock. This happened in the evening on a Friday evening. Uh, when I called them on Monday morning and said, listen, I accidentally got into your system. I don't know what I did, but I logged in and, and must have hit a few keys the wrong way because when I, you know, when, when I hit a couple of keys, I got into your system. So, you know, uh, I'm sure you want to know about that. So here I am, uh, you know, lock me up or whatever. So uh, the attack, the, the, the you know, the, the the, the, the accident had, had occurred, the incident had occurred. I had taken snapshots, snapshots of what had occurred. I told them what I had done, et cetera. And this specific company um, just told me, don't worry about it. You know, don't do it again and don't worry about it. Uh, they didn't take any, any information from me or contact information, even though I offered everything. They were kind of not, uh, you know, really lackadaisical in their response. I couldn't believe that this company, uh, after someone told them from outside, I accidentally, you know, got into your, inside systems 
uh, didn't want to know more. Um, so, so, uh, so that's why I say that you know the notion of um, you know when and, and how you're going to pursue legal action needs to be thought about way in advance. Uh, in terms of the incident responders that um, will be preparing the, the company uh, for uh, an attack, or hopefully it doesn't happen, but you know just to be prepared, these these things are good to do. Uh, how much authority do they have? Um, you know, when an incident happens, or you you find out that someone's in your system, it's a very scary thing. Um, uh, you know, and I can tell you, having been on the scene at many companies, when someone's in their house that shouldn't be, and is maybe moving things around or touching files or opening and closing files, uh, you know, people are freaking out, and uh, unless they have a well-developed plan on who's in charge and what what they can do with that attacker in terms of letting the person continue to uh, move through the files uh, in terms of gaining some uh, aspect of counter hacking, and namely, what is that person interested in? Is this just a script kitty who happened to get into our system who's just poking around? Uh, is this uh, Professor Gabberty who accidentally got into our system and is uh, and is you know in the process of logging off? I mean, who who are these people? And uh, ultimately, the the person that des decides what to do with these attackers, whether it's um, uh, accidental or intentional is the incident responder, and usually the chief incident responder is the person who's authorized to take uh, matters into his or her own hands. So these various templates need to be constructed prior to these attacks um, occurring. So of course I mentioned a couple of types of uh, incidents that we have on the books. One of them is accidental, that's somebody who accidentally logs into the wrong system uh, or who accidentally forgets to log off. Um, intentional, of course, uh, types of incidents are those incidents where someone's trying to either test your system to see what your defenses are, or uh, is actually in the process of stealing data from your system, or it could be uh, employee cause. You know, a lot of times uh, em employees do things uh, that they that they uh, shouldn't be doing. Uh, for example, just you know, walking away, not logging off, and walking away from a screen or a system uh, that might have some. Uh, information displayed on that screen that uh, you know people shouldn't be seeing, and that has uh, you know pr pretty interesting ramifications uh, for that person. So, for example, uh, what would you do in the case where you walk by someone's screen who just got up to use the facilities, and uh, on the screen was uh, a half-typed letter of resignation by that individual, and you know the individual and you know the individual's boss, you now have come across information inadvertently. Uh, that person has a, a, a reasonable um, notion to privacy, but you've seen the data yourself, or say someone prints a letter of resignation, puts it on his or her desk, and then goes to lunch, and you happen to come across that. Um, so so th these, these are incidents. These are real-life incidents that do happen, and we do get you know, called in for these types of incidents from time to time. So being prepared for them um, is, is, is often key. Uh, the third bullet there talks about uh, handling techniques and this notion of um, employee termination. Uh, I, I want to say just very carefully that uh, to, to the entire audience here, don't assume that you have anonymity in the workplace. Don't assume that you know, what you're doing on your keyboard uh, is, is not being viewed by anybody. Uh, in larger companies, usually the network operations group can, can collects logs and watches uh, people's activities and saves those activities. So if you're someone who shops every day at Macy's or Nordstrom's or uh, Marks and Spencer or who, whoever, uh, and you spend a half an hour, you know, um, during company time, um, you know, idly doing your shopping, um, they, 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 uh, not only do they own that data, and not only do you give up your right for privacy to that data, that data can be used against you later on in, in, in the court of law. And most typically, at least here in New York City, what is commonly done when, when companies want to get rid of uh, you know, mid-management and upper level management people is they start taking snapshots of their computer, which is a, a, you know, a forensic term for um, the logs and, and hold on to those and uh, try to make a case that you know, you're, you're, you're uh, not, not doing your dil due diligence at work or slacking off or what have you. So just be very aware that you know, every time that you're typing something on your computer, uh, just, just uh, 
uh, think that whatever you're typing is being displayed on the uh, big screen at Times Square or something. And a lot of people are looking at that and, and they have every right to because it's their computer that you're using. So don't expect any privacy at work. And again, that all falls under the umbrella of uh, incident handling and uh, event uh, identification. So when we talk about uh, criminal actions, um, you know, obviously it's necessary to, to punish the, the criminals that um, are infiltrating your network and you want to put them away for many, many years and uh, or in some instances uh, as in that famous movie with the hacker that was running around doing fraudulent bank checks, uh, he ended up working for the FBI and then uh, now is a, still active as a, uh, a consultant to the New York City Police Department. So there are uh, times when the, when the hackers um, get hired by the, the good guys uh, to help them to become uh, blue team members or people that actually defend networks. Um, so, so the network uh, that is in place in your organization and the computers that are attached to it themselves uh, could be used as a, a uh, by an intruder as a launch point a launch point to attack other companies. So, you know, even though you're the you might be a victim of an attacker who gained access to your computers, maybe that um, attacker who is inside your computer is not interested in uh, your, uh, you know, secret sauce or, the, or, or, or your uh, jewels, as it were, uh, but instead just wants to have an IP address that's something other than their own to launch an attack on another company. So when that company does an investigation, company B, uh, we'll see that company A is attacking them, but company A is completely unaware that they are the attackers. And the next thing you know, they're being hauled into court and, and uh, named as perpetrators in some criminal event. So uh, here too, this underscores the need uh, to prepare as best possible for uh, in, in incident handling and uh, intrusion detection. I mentioned already this notion of uh, this expectation of privacy that, that people have, and it varies from town to town and city to city and state to state, certainly in the United States, and it virtually is a, it, it uh, also varies in different territories as, as well as different uh, uh, countries. You know, so it depends on what nation you're in, the privacy laws um, uh, are, are radically different. Uh, here, in, here in the States, uh, as I just mentioned, we, we don't have this expectation of privacy. We have a little bit of uh, reasonable privacy that someone's not going to, um, you know, if we, leave, if we leave our keyboard for two minutes to, to run to get a drink of water, someone's not going to jump into our seat and start using our computer to do things, uh, even if it's like purchasing something or doing something that uh, they don't want to get caught doing, like just visiting a website very quickly. Um, so, so that's kind of a punishable offense, but still, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to see where the line is. It's a, it's a moving line. In other organizations, um, there is this notion that you, you are expected to maintain privacy and, and to uh, not abuse the, the privacy expectation of others, so it, it, it varies. If you've been in the uh, EU lately, uh, I went back to uh, France this summer, and no matter which browser I was using, this, uh, this um, alert would come up on my screen. So. Uh, this was a, a notification by Google telling me that there's a, a, a GDPR, a, a, a data privacy regulation that's going to quickly become law in the European Union and that dictates uh, what Google uh, does with the data that I'm about to enter into my cyber session. So they're telling me in advance, uh, listen, if you use our product, um, you, can have, uh, main, you can expect uh, very little uh, right to privacy. We can sell your data. We can sell your click-throughs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This way, when I uh, uh, eventually get to the last page of this notification and click I accept, uh, then Google is in um, uh, is in conformance with the GDPR, the the General Data Protection Regulation um, mechanism that again is about to be enforced in a few years. Here in the states, we don't have anything like that. We uh, it's a kind of double-edged sword. We, we look at the Europeans jealously and say, boy, that's very good that you have a, uh, a, a government entity that's looking to protect the people uh, here in the U.S. It's, it's kind of semi-Wild West 
in other places like China, if you've ever, ever been to China, um, it's, it's the complete Wild West. Every time I go to China and I plug my laptop in, my hard disk light lights up steadily because of all the uh, people or uh, all the hackers that are sensing fresh meat because they see a new MAC address on some network that hasn't been there before and they start probing me. And I, there is no cyber police I can call and I have no, no, uh, no rights there as, as, a, as an end user. Uh, I'll, I'll mention quickly because I have a, a few minutes of, of time here, uh, just a couple of um, case studies that uh, we examine uh, in the classroom about uh, expectations of right to privacy, et cetera. So uh, most people have been on eBay and have either bought or sold things on eBay. Um, but in, in, in other nations, the way that eBay is used is uh, typically governed by the, the government. So for example, in the US, if I type Nazi uh, paraphernalia, I can buy any sort of uh, World War II um, daggers or helmets or any kind of uh, propaganda from uh, you know that, that horrible war, uh, and and freely buy and sell that as I please. Um, when George Bush took his uh, oath of office, about two days later, uh, in the er, in the early uh, 2000s, uh, the nation of France sued him, uh, and the, the the president of France said that there were people inside of France that were buying and selling these uh, Nazi paraphernalia on eBay, uh, and that's against the French law. And the, the president had to explain to him that uh, here in the U.S., um, you know, George Bush can't tell eBay what to do and vice versa, uh, that, that the, the regulations that uh, apply there don't necessarily apply here. So when you cross, you know, from one nation state to another, um, uh, various laws are in effect uh, to, to, to uh, govern what you can do with data. So here in New York, we get called, my company gets called. Uh, to do forensic reporting and we, we go to a, a site, we take forensic image images of laptops and servers and network settings and things like that in preparation for a, a pending lawsuit. Uh, from time to time we get called from the Europeans. We have a few uh, pending cases in, in Britain and one in Turkey where the, the, the Turks are each accusing each other of um, violating election rules and regulations and they want us to come over there and do a forensic examination of their computers. There's only one problem and when you leave the US and step foot into another country and you take a snapshot of someone's computer, it's against the law to, to take that out of the country. So I have to explain to people, you know, your laws are much, much different than our laws. So incident handlers uh, have a have a difficult job. I could I could come to Britain and do my work there and kind of format my disk and not leave with a single bit of information from my client's computer. Um, but here in the US, I can fly uh, 3,000 miles New York to California, uh, gr grab someone's hard disk information in San Francisco, bring it back here to New York uh, and do my work on it and, uh, and, and be assured that no one's gonna come after me for violating any sort of privacy rights or what have you. I'm gonna take a, a second to pause uh, the discussion to allow DJ to uh, conduct uh, the, the first question of her Thank you very much. So you'll just see a quick poll pop up. And if you could just take the next 20, 30 seconds to click your answer, that would be awesome. Okay, it looks like the answering has stopped, so I'm going to close the poll now and turn it back over to Jim. Okay, thank you, DJ. So continuing on and uh, talking for a bit about uh, the external attacker. So external attackers, that is uh, attackers from outside your organization. It could be an ex-employee, it could be a competition, it could be a nation state, it could be anybody. Uh, the very first thing that an external attacker is, is likely to do is to harvest the vulnerable machines in your network or on your network. And the reason that they do that, and the reason that I teach that to my students um, when showing them how to hack, is uh, we want to try to get as far away from our machine as we can possibly get when conducting an attack. 
So if I'm going to attack someone in New Jersey, I'm not going to sit here in New York State and launch an attack uh, across the border. I'm going to go through Germany, maybe pick up someone in Alaska, go through Hawaii, you know, kind of circle, circumnavigate the world uh, on, on prior machines that we've already kind of identified as not being up to date with patches or having certain ports open or running applications that uh, are malware with, that are previously embedded backdoors for us to use, et cetera. So um, if, for, for, the, for the purposes of attribution that is trying to prove that it was me, you have to go to a lot of different countries uh, to, to ultimately get, get to me. And many of those countries, because of their privacy laws, will not let the logs of who's been rummaging through computer networks uh, become public information. So uh, that's the reason why we're seeing, and you've seen as, a, as a, an end user, we're all seeing uh, a rise in these uh, email phishing attempts that uh, are getting better and better and better. You know, the bad guys, uh, uh, I read a report this morning uh, that the, the, uh, the, these malware uh, strategies are up by 38%. Um, I've actually accidentally clicked on, clicked on a few of them myself. And if I have time at the end of the uh, discussion, I'll tell you a, a way to keep, uh, to protect yourself, to keep from accidentally uh, downloading malware. Uh, I'll take a, just a, a brief second though and tell you that one of the uh, best sources for malware, I know this is gonna break everybody's heart, but it's true, uh, that's YouTube. About one third of the videos on YouTube have malware embedded on them. Uh, so that when you click on uh, a song or a video that you'd like to watch, um, you're giving that uh, program permission to put stuff in, inside your computer. And one of the things it could be putting inside is a program that opens up uh, the back door of your computer uh, and logs the address and then sends information back to my computer, uh, which is essentially giving me, you know, carte blanche access to your machine whenever I, whenever I feel like it. So getting kind of scary out there and we have to you know, really do our, our due diligence, due diligence in, in defending ourselves and protecting ourselves. So this, this notion of logs, um, your computer maintains internal logs. Every time you turn your computer on, every time you shut it off, every time you reboot, every time you log in, every time you log out, uh, there, there's a file kept inside of Windows or internally in the system that tracks that sort of stuff. And uh, it's say, uh, say, let's talk about Microsoft Windows for a moment, which pretty much 80% or 90% of the world is using. Uh, Windows has an enormous amount of logs that can be turned on that track every single keystroke, every event that you're, that you're doing. The problem with logs is they grow very, very large, very, very quickly. So companies that are um, maintaining some uh, uh, Pre uh, preventative measures in place, trying to keep the bad guys out, will turn on a few logs for some uh, machines and, and not turn on all the logs, or we'll just put you know, several machines that are near to the router or to the switch or the outward facing devices. Uh, we'll, we'll, they'll they'll turn, activate those logs and watch those logs. But if you are two or three layers deep, if you're in the middle of sitting literally in the middle of a, of a building, or if you're in a couple of full floors down away from the access point to the internet, chances are your logs are not being turned on, and those logs are critical to determine, um, you know, kind of what happened on your inside your computer if your computer was used as part of an external attack or trying to pivot through your system. Um, so uh, here, here again, I'll tell you that uh, that most of the criminal activity happens in plain sight. People think that um, you know when when the banks go to sleep between you know twelve p.m. and 5 a.m. or something, or when most, come, when most of us are sleeping, that's when the bad guys are, are trying to break into accounts because no one will see and they won't know until the next day, etc. cetera. Uh, but in actuality, it's, it's the complete opposite. Uh, the middle of the day, 12 o'clock uh, p.m. is where uh, the, the most amount of, t uh, of hack, hacking activity occurs uh, because you want them, actually it's before 12 o'clock, because 12 o'clock is lunchtime. So maybe 10:30, 11 o'clock or so is a good time for attackers to do their stuff because everybody's logging on, everybody's logging off. There's a lot of activity happening. So uh, if, a, if a company has a couple of hundred or a few thousand people in the building logging on and off their servers, you know, trying to find uh, one or two people who aren't employees 
of the of the company or who log in but don't have a name associated with the company or have a you know an odd sounding name or a weird address or something. Um, so so uh, you know be be aware that it 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 doesn't happen at night. Most of this stuff tends to take place uh, during the day. Uh, the notion of internal attackers is causing a lot of grief uh, these days. So when we talk about an, an internal uh, attacker, we mean someone who's actually um, you know, a black hat or, or you know, a criminal who's inside and is a trusted employee of your company that is either making off with data that he or she shouldn't uh, be uh, taking outside of the company or even having the ability to look at and using that uh, to his or, or her best advantage. So when we think of people like that, we think of uh, the former head of the FBI, Robert Hansen. Uh, someone who was watched very little because, after all, he was the he was the top dog. He was the big guy who who would accuse the you know uh, the president of some company as as the as a uh, an attacker. You know that's the last person you want to uh, watch. But it turns out sometimes the, the people at the top are the very people who are stealing stealing the secret recipe and making off uh, you know un completely undetected. Uh, Bradley Manning uh, was an army uh, working the army and was a, a trusted insider. He, he would uh, come in every day with a bunch of uh, CDs and uh, just stole massive amounts of, of data and for, uh, gave that data to, to WikiLeaks and we know what happened after that. And of course, the, 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 the mother or the father of all the outside atta inside attackers, Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden uh, was, uh, used to walk in uh, to the office every day with, uh, I think it was, um, what's her name? Uh, one, of, one of the pop stars today. Uh, I forget which which one it was, but he would walk in with CD-ROMs and uh, of, of music that had la you know her label on it, and two or three of the discs, the DVDs or CD-ROMs, uh, actually had music on it. And the the rest of the DVDs were blank, and he was using those DVDs uh, to walk in and out of a top secret military installation uh, with with uh, a plum of of taking data. So uh, so so these inside attackers are very very hard to uh, to find. And that again points to this, the uh, severe importance of logging uh, and, and monitoring these logs. You know, so so um, when it comes to uh, information security, it's kind of a, a zero sum game, or 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 maybe not. When you think about the idea of a company spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars maintaining logs and hiring people to look at those logs, and they're doing a good job if they find nothing. Uh, so it's it's kind of the opposite of the way that we're trained to think. So we tend not to do that, even though if we if we had people watching these logs and watching uh, the data from the inside, uh, a lot of these bad attacks wouldn't wouldn't be happening. Uh, so as an incident handler, I follow the uh, SAND methodology of incident handling, the, the Pickerel methodology, uh, preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. So I'll kind of roll through that rather quickly. Uh, preparation, preparation trumps everything. Um, the, uh, the, the, the notion of, um, uh, of having a, a, a bag that is ready to, to roll so that when something happens, um, you can respond. So I've got a lot of friends of mine that run small businesses and they tell me that their servers go down or their networks go down and uh, you know what should they do? And I tell them to take their spare laptops or their spare networks and to bring, put those online. And they say, "My what?" Uh, so, so you know, someone someone who's prepared in the incident handling world usually is is uh, 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 the type of person that goes on eBay and buys um, extra computers, extra hard drives, extra thumb drives, just to have that stuff around so that when something happens, they can switch gears and take the bad machine out of the loop and plug in the replacement machine. At, you know, at the drop of a hat. Uh, policy, of course, is the number one driver um, for for uh, any sort of incident handling, uh, because if you haven't planned for it, that, then uh, you have no policy to handle it. So we all know uh, policies of um, you know employee termination and employee hiring, but what about uh, what's what's the policy of somebody you know uh, reading somebody else's screen and um, and I don't know t telling the boss. Of the person who typed the letter of resignation that he or she intends to resign, and that person then tries to sue somebody. What's the policy uh, for for the company for that sort of thing? So all of this necessitates some sort of uh, managerial support. Uh, the higher, the better, of course, um, both before 
the, uh, the, the planning phase, during the planning phase, and after the planning phase. Um, I started my life a long time ago as a computer programmer, and as I kind of was bumped up the ranks as manager and director and uh, IT director, et cetera, um, I would ask people if they backed up their program code because they'd spend a day working on something and I'd say, did you back up your computer? Because a good programmer will constantly save their uh, files as they go along. And I would tell them, you know, if I stand next to you and pull the plug on your computer uh, right now, are you going to get upset with me? And I can tell who backed up the systems and who didn't back up the systems. So, you know, managers should also constantly be reinforcing the notion of maintaining uh, um, backups as frequently as possible. Management should also be involved in selecting the team members that will help to uh, prepare uh, for the uh, eventuality of uh, becoming a, uh, a victim of, uh, of, of cyber uh, criminal activity. Uh, as well, uh, management should start contacting or at least plan to have contacted uh, legal people and law enforcement. You know, you don't call 911, you don't call the police uh, for the first time after you've had an incident. You call them before the incident happens and say, just so we know, you know, who is the person I should be asking uh, for, what are some of the things I should be doing, what are the, you as the law enforcement arm, uh, you know, we've been blessed by not having had a, an attack yet, what are some of the things that uh, I'd be, uh, you know, well, well suited to know in advance of these attacks. Likewise, your legal team, you know, you don't pick up the yellow pages and start searching for a law firm that handles incident attacks and when you find out some, that somebody's in your network or somebody has stole your data. You do that before. Identif identification and preparation of all this stuff is, is key. I mentioned this notion of having a jump bag. Uh, so incident trainers at the bottom point there. We call it a jump bag. It's essentially a, a, a bag that has everything in it. Uh, you know, think, think of the, uh, your, your, the person, your favorite uncle or somebody who has a tool kit, tool kit with every kind of uh, spanner and wrench and screwdriver that you need to fix your sink so that when you're over somebody's house and there's a problem, that person is the person that will be prepared to solve this. In the IT world, we, we call these incident responders. And these are the people that have things like uh, checklists and procedures. Uh, when someone's in the system, what's, what's the plan of attack? Do we tell everybody to log off? Do we keep them logged in? Um, do we turn the machines off? Do we keep them you know, turned on? Uh, who do we call? Who do we notify? Do we tell the press? Do we call the law? Do we call 911? Um, back in that horrible 9-11 uh, uh, tragedy uh, 17 years ago, um, I remember watching uh, the, the TV afterwards and learning about the number of people that were in the building and the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that made it out alive because all of the uh, companies in those two buildings that were knocked down had an incident uh, plan for, uh, for physical attack and emergency evacuation of the building. So, you know, the fire warden was identified. They pr would practice these things periodically. So, you know, when, when that horrible event happened, which again, how do you plan for something like that? But the fact that when it did happen, the incident responders uh, snapped to attention and immediately started evacuating people uh, in, in a methodical way, you know, that saved countless thousands of lives versus people running around uh, with their hair on fire trying to figure out what to do. Um, back in the Hurricane Sandy days, uh, where I live on Long Island, we lost power for eight days. And I, I have clients and I have my students who send me emails and I have my boss at my university who sends me emails. And not having power is not an excuse for not responding to these emails. So what I had found out that I was able to do was I took my laptop with me uh, I drove to the local um, uh, Macy's, the, the, the local uh, mall nearest to my home, and parked in two feet of water in my car, uh, in my Jeep, plugged in my laptop, and um, was able to pick up the signal for a Wi-Fi device that was in Macy's and was open to the public. So I was able to sit in an evacuated parking lot, you know, knee-deep in water, safe and secluded in my, in my car, and uh, answer hundreds of emails and and conduct my my life, uh, you know, with, without uh, without um, uh, being affected by this this uh, you know, eight day loss of electricity. So um, that kind of mentality is is, is kind of what I'm uh, leaning toward here. Step two of the 
pick a role is uh, defenses is identification. How do you identify an incident? Um, is it an incident if uh, Jim Gabberty logs in from an, uh, a, an IP address that's located in New York City to access his bank account and simultaneously, two minutes later, logs in from Hong Kong to that same bank? You know, what should Citibank, what should Chase Bank do if they see Jim Gabberty logging in from two different parts of the world? Um, should they shut? Should they lock me out? Should they uh, close? You know, close access to my account? Or, you know, what what do you do? Do you let the first the first one in continue and 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 halt the second person from logging in? Um, you know, and, and so it, it sounds like that's a potential breach. But you know, what if I told you that? Oh, uh, that's my wife that's using my ID. Um, you know, she doesn't have her uh, account, or she logged herself out of her own account, so she's using my account. So that's why we have two Jim Gabberty simultaneously logging in. Um, so so uh, also this notion of third parties. You know, many, many companies have third parties that log into their, their systems um, uh, throughout the day and throughout the evening uh, to do certain things. Um, it could be uh, Microsoft uh, doing updates. It could be uh, the network people. It could be, uh, it could be anybody. So you know, how, how do you know if you see somebody who, should, who you don't know is in your system, you know, do you automatically ring the alarm bell and say, I don't recognize this person, uh, launch the plan, or do you actually have a, a series of steps that you take uh, to and, a, and an ultimate decider that decides whether or not to officially say that an event has become an incident and that incident needs to then be uh, handled effectively. And uh, of course, the, starting by notifying the correct people and, and the like. So uh, the identification uh, phase of the, the um, incident response then is, is it, it makes use of the smart system. I know most of you have seen that, uh, uh, that term used, that the things uh, in the IT world, we, we constantly talk about the smart system. So the guidelines should be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Um, the, uh, the notion, that, again, of having a primary incident handler is key. Uh, there's only one person when when uh, when people are in a system or a system has been penetrated. There's one person who makes the decisions uh, of what to do, and that is the person who has ultimate authority and can override, you know, the the CIO, or the CEO of a company. That person has an incredible amount of power and an incredible operates under an incredible amount of stress because they're ultimately responsible for uh, handling the systems. So containment. Once a, uh, a, a system has been compromised, uh, what do you do? You know, you walk in and you see that someone's on your network or someone's inside your computer. You tell your boss and your boss may call the incident responder over and the incident handler might say, um, you know, we have to uh, make a snapshot of this. So, so, you know, whether or not you pull the system off of a network is it depends on the policies and the procedures that you've already maintained. There is no one way to handle uh, these types of events. In some uh, instances, it makes sense to literally pull the plug, you know, just absolutely kill the machine, shut it down, and uh, no more data will be leaked from the system. In other cases, uh, you, you may want to know how the person got in there to begin with, and you need to make a snapshot of the system. So you actually have to take time backing up the data, backing up the memory, uh, and, and, and trying to contain the system as best as, as you possibly can. Eradication refers to uh, the notion of uh, putting into effect that part of your disaster recovery plan or your, um, your, your, your uh, business continuity plan, uh, putting the system back online, right? So if, a, if someone is inside your system, uh, you may want to reinstall Windows, you may want to reinstall your application, but before you reach for the backup media and start putting your system back online, um, it's probably a good idea to find out how the person got in there to begin with because if you put the system back online then the attacker can come back a second time uh, and use that same vulnerability to get into the, to the system. So uh, recovery I spoke to already that's just making sure that you don't bring a system uh, back online that accidentally has compromised code in, on it or in it and then finally lessons learned. Um, 
you know, the notion of sending recommendations to management, like, you know, we've been breached and this is how we think it happened, this is how we responded, this is what we did uh, upon finding out uh, that the event was declared to be an actual incident. Uh, these are the people that were contacted. Here's a summary report uh, and we're going to have a follow-up meeting to discuss the actions we took. I'm going to pause for a minute to let, allow DJ to take her second poll. Thank you very much. So the second poll is going to pop up on your screen. So again, we'll give you about 30 seconds to answer that and then we will we'll continue on with the presentation. Okay, it looks like everyone has answered, so I am going to close the poll in two, one, now. <laughs> Great. Okay, uh, we have a, a number of slides to get through, not too many more, but I'm going to speed up the, uh, the, the presentation pace a little bit. Uh, so when it comes to our post-mortem review after we've had an incident uh, effectively handled and uh, reports have been generated, etc., uh, I want to bring to your attention that the the, uh, the second to last point, the penultimate point, as it were, on that slide uh, labeled post-mortem review, and that is uh, to inspect a warning ban banner. Uh, most companies most companies don't do a good job in um, preparing and displaying a warning banner that um, tells the users that are about to connect to their system that uh, you know once. We, gain, we give you access to the system, we hold the right and we will be tracking your IP address and your machine address, et cetera, and your credentials, uh, and that we will take criminal uh, measures against you if you proceed with unauthorized access or uh, otherwise malfeasance of this network, or something that your legal people can type up um, uh, so that in the event uh, that uh, it happens again, uh, that you get um, uh, attacked you have a, a, a stronger case because when you're in court, many times the judge will say, you know, uh, did you tell the person who was in your network that they didn't, they, they weren't allowed to be on your network? And if the answer is no, then case dismissed. They didn't know that they were doing wrong, uh, so you necessarily can't go after them. So uh, forensics, this notion of making copies of, uh, of hard drives and, and uh, kind of coming out with the, the, the uh, Coming up with the big question: How did they get in? Um, who who does this sort of uh, uh, investigation? Is it done in, is it done internally? Is it it's usually done by hiring out an outside firm? And some of the steps they take are are, are on the following pages, following slide shots rather. So uh, so some of the investigation steps are uh, to detect and and contain, uh, and that refers to this notion of um, monitoring continuous monitoring, having people re, uh, look through audit trails and look, review logs and, uh, and try to maintain some policies where uh, employees of the company are uh, warned about or at least notified about the kind of activity that they're allowed to do uh, when using a, a company assets and the things that they shouldn't be doing with those same assets. Uh, reports to management, of course, always follow uh, that sort of work. Um, uh, it, part of the investigation sta stage also as well is um, uh, the preliminary investigation, examining, uh, talking to witnesses, you know, when did you first see that someone was in the system, um, you know, ha ha what, was, what was actually done to a system. I mean, if I, if I break into your home in the middle of the night and leave and I don't touch anything, did I commit a crime? Um, if I break into your network in the middle of the day and I leave and I don't do anything, did I commit a crime? You know, you have to show some some um, uh, some intention intentionality on my end uh, in the, in the courts. Uh, you know, be, before you proceed with this this sort of stuff. So disclosure de determination: uh, Do you have to disclose? That is a huge huge question in the world of cybersecurity. If you get breached, are you required to notify uh, a the authorities, b the press? 
uh, C, maybe your industry groups, etc. Your certainly your your customers, your clients, your employees, and uh, I can tell you uh, with some degree of sadness that in the in the U.S. Uh, these disclosure laws vary from state to state to state. The the, the quote-unquote best uh, disclosure laws are those written in California, Texas, and New York. Uh, so if a public company gets breached, then uh, if the company doesn't uh, come forth and say that uh, they were breached within a certain uh, a time frame, then people could face jail action. Uh, of course, that brings into focus the recent occurrence of Equifax. And uh, you know, I'll leave it to you as far as what you think you think that Equifax did a good thing or a bad thing um, with their with the way that they handled their uh, their breach, um, and uh, and and by the way, look where Equifax um, is legally uh, run out of. Is it a New York firm or a California firm or a Texas firm or some other law uh, under some other law jurisdictions firm? So uh, I'll let that I'll let you do a little investigation on your own. Uh, so I'll skip some of these investigation steps because these are kind of common sense things. How deep do you want to go in finding out how got, how companies got in? How much money do you have to spend? Uh, what are the legal impl implications? Um, you know, what do you do with the data versus uh, you know, what do you what do you maintain in, is, as far as uh, you know privacy, etc. I'm going to skip this next part here because it gets a little technical. Where I talk about how you should be uh, collecting data in a, in a sound manner. I'll mention briefly this notion of the advanced persistent threat. Uh, these are nation state actors. These are the people behind the scenes trying to get you to click on um, on malware that's sent to you via email. Uh, this this is think, think China, uh, believe it or not, India, um, Russia certainly, uh, are, are, and Iran are trying are constantly probing our, our public and and. Uh, private infrastructures to, to determine vulnerabilities. So um, you can't let your guard down for one minute. You have to be very careful who you let into your system, et cetera. I'm going to skip rules of evidence because this gets into the legalities of, of that, but I'll, I'll certainly have this uh, available for you online to look at. I'll mention chain of custody and chain of evidence briefly. Uh, a, a chain of custody is uh, essentially when a breach happens and uh, someone like myself or an event handler comes in and makes a custodial copy, a forensic copy of your system, uh, we have to prepare, be prepared to discuss in the court of law um, who had access to that copied system, uh, where it was stored, who had uh, um, uh, access to it, how often we accessed it, what computers we used to touch the data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all done obviously to prove that the uh, prove or disprove that the forensic copy is a relevant and that is b reliable that you can trust trust it uh, dj you want to jump in real quick and give a third poll yes i would love to okay here is the third and final poll for the presentation so again we'll give about 30 to 45 seconds for people to just click and vote Okay, it looks like everybody has participated. Thank you. So I'm going to close the poll and hand it back over to Jim. Great. Um, again, I'm watching the time. We only have about three slides left. I want to talk briefly about uh, uh, data recovery and storage. So um, all companies have a requirement to make backups of their data to protect the assets of the firm for legal issues and for obviously commercial issues um, and uh, the, these vary once again from state to state but generally there are several years uh, worth of data I know that for example uh, in the US an individual can get audited I believe it's six or seven years after they filed their taxes so you're expected to keep copies of all of your tax relevant data and companies are generally um, you know faced with challenge with the same uh, requirement to to keep data uh, online or um, 
certainly stored on backups that can be brought online within, say, a 24-hour period. And there's many reasons for that. Um, and uh, I'll just mention to you briefly that um, one, one of the reasons that companies uh, do this is because companies uh, always get called into court uh, as part of cybersecurity events, not because of an attack that uh, that that specific company may have um, inflicted, uh, been inflicted, uh, but rather uh, that that company was uh, part of a middleman in in a, in a denial of service attack or some other sort of attack where they were used without them even knowing it. So um, if two or three years go by and a company finds out that it was hacked, they're going to go through their, their logs, and if they, it finds out that some of the addresses that were involved in some malfeasance or some cyber activity uh, were in fact brought back to your company, you have to have the ability to show that you have uh, um, you know, a, a court, court admissible uh, backups of your data uh, and have the ability to read the data even after several years have gone by. So for example, if you were working back in 2003 or 2004 and you have uh, an email that was written in Microsoft Office 2003, uh, try reading that um, in, in the current version of Office. Uh, man, many of the times Microsoft changes its formats and, and having to maintain uh, machine readable uh, data in its native files can be problematic and, and potentially expensive. So uh, data recovery and, and, and maintaining uh, online or near online storage uh, capacity is very important, as is data retention. Uh, data ownership. Who owns the data in your firm? Who is the custodian of the data? Who is the one that gets the fines if the data gets uh, infiltrated or altered or deleted or some other thing happens? So uh, knowing who owns data and who the custodian is that's in charge of backing up the data is an important concept that incident handlers will always ask uh, for you know names to, to uh, the titles. And uh, my last slide here uh, talks about data handling. That data handling is evidence. So um, you know be, be very careful about when you're backing up systems what is on your hard drive. So uh, so what what I mean by that is that. Uh, you know, sometimes people put sensitive material um, on their hard drive that is uh, that that may find itself into a court a court um, indirectly because it's attached to another e-discovery effort. So uh, be again be be careful with what you put on your computers. Uh, maintain some uh, due diligence of how you store your data, how your data gets backed up, and how you have access and who has access. To that data, because if and when you're the uh, subject of a, a cyber crime, then an incident handler is going to be appearing at your door asking you a bunch of questions uh, that you need to be prepared to to answer. So, with that, we have a couple of minutes left. I'll take some questions. If we have any questions, anybody? So, as a reminder, you can type your questions in the chat box, which is located at the right hand side of your screen uh, towards the bottom. So, you can either direct the questions to the entire audience or to me at ACCA USA, and we will filter them over to Jim Gabberty. And we always know that the best questions come on the ride home, subway, car, sitting in traffic. So if you do think of anything that pops into your mind as a question later today, please feel free to email us at acca.usa at acca global, and we'll make sure to get an answer for you. But we did have a question come through. The question reads, with the various privacy laws in different countries and many cloud-based applications stored offshore, could there, be an, uh, could there be a situation where a breach of privacy in one country is not in another? Does this cause an issue for professionals like you? Yes, it, it's a huge headache for us, um, as, as well as it is for uh, companies themselves. Uh, when you put something in the cloud, you have no idea where that cloud is located. Uh, just because you're in, say, the United States, putting putting and you put your data, say, into an IBM cloud or or a Microsoft cloud or some other vendor's cloud, 
you have no way of knowing what server that that data is stored on, where that data is physically stored, how that data is backed up, how that who else is on your your uh, platform. So you know you you could be putting very sensitive uh, information on a website um, th that's you know run somewhere in the cloud, and on that same machine on the same hard drive uh, right next to your file folder uh, could be a porno site. <laughs> that, that somebody's running um, and uh, you know the companies do not allow people like me forensic examiners into uh, their cloud they, that, that's why you have to sign all sorts of um, uh, you know disclosure uh, contracts etc so short answer is yes it causes lots and lots of troubles lawyers have their hands filled these days uh, with all the implications of moving to the, to the cloud uh, I wanted to just if, if we have time we have 30 seconds to make one quick point we do. We did have one question, another question come through. Do you want to answer that? Okay. So this yeah. one says, generally, what is what is hacking crime called in the court of law? Uh, uh, I would say cyber uh, malfeasance, uh, IT malfeasance, uh, cyber security activity. You know, different, different judges call it different things and courts are, 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 are as well have their hands filled because, you know, the judges only know what we tell them. So essentially, when I walk in to uh, uh, defend or, or um, attack my, my opponent, um, you know, th their readiness to, to answer questions that might be a little bit too complicated for the court to understand sometimes leads to the judges not really getting the whole thing and dismissing these cases. So uh, it, it's very, very difficult. Uh, the, just quickly, I wanted to mention that uh, a way to protect yourself, and this is a, a very important takeaway, uh, to keep your malware off of your computer. Create a, a, a non-administrative user account. All of us, when we get our computers, we set ourselves up as the administrator of our, of our laptop, and we use that administrator account every day to log in and go on the internet with. If you set up a second account, that's a limited user. You can still go to YouTube, you can still do everything that you normally would do with your admin account, however you're doing it as a limited user, which keeps malware from getting into the inner workings of your computer and will absolutely serve as a, 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 a Chinese wall, if you, if, if you will, uh, against malware. Any okay. Nope, that, that is it. I think that we should wrap it up just in the spirit of time. Uh, do you have any last-minute parting wisdoms for us, Jim? Uh, treat your incident handlers with care. Uh, again, be careful what you put on your, on your computer. Be careful who you give your uh, passwords to. You shouldn't be giving any of that information uh, to anybody because it will come back and haunt you one day. And make backups. <laughs> Thank you. I think backup is a very good key to take away from this. So we just wanted to thank you, Jim, and thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. And as soon as the remaining modules are scheduled for this cyber series that we're doing, we'll certainly let you know. And again, we will be emailing out the CPE certificates within three business days. So thank you for your patience. And as we close down the webinar, there will be an evaluation that pops up at the end of the training. So if you could take a few minutes just to um, take that evaluation, we'd really uh, appreciate it. If you have any questions in the future, please reach out to us at acca.usa at accaglobal.com. And we look forward to seeing you all on the next webinar. Have a great day.